Are you the parent of a teen and you're not quite sure where to start with the body literacy conversation? The more that they know, the healthier they will be as a teen and into their adult years. Join me this week as we take a look at how to make that conversation a little less awkward and just how fundamentally important it is for their development and your relationship. Hi, I'm Adrienne Irizarry. I'm an Eastern medicine practitioner who is passionate about women's health and helping women live their best lives. My goal is to put you in the driver's seat of your menstrual health, offering period solutions for a symptom-free life. Statements made in this program are for educational purposes only and not intended as a substitution for medical consultation or advice. We do not claim to diagnose, treat, or cure any diseases. This podcast is inclusive and welcomes all gender identities. The focus of the program is on biological function and we will use the term women throughout, but it is referencing physiological and social challenges for biology, not identity. Come as you are, I am happy you're here and welcome all performances of identity. I hope you find something helpful in this show. Welcome back to another episode of the Reproductive Rebel Podcast. I thought that in light of some conversations that I've had with moms of teens lately and being thoroughly in the teen stage myself, that it would be helpful to have a conversation about, well, how do I talk to my teen, right? So body literacy in our country or education around how bleeding bodies work is rather dismal. Many bleeding bodies learn about cycles when the blood appears. Many people learn how to care for them with having a parent pass a box of tampons through the door and going, here you go, kid, figure it out, right? How many of you are like kind of chuckling and nodding right now, right? So these are all things that I've heard from many, many of my clients over the years. And one of the things that literally blows their mind when they first start working with me is, you know, any of you who've been around and listened to the show for any length of time know that for me, education is one of the most important things in the entire world when it comes to how to take care of your body and the health of your body because we don't know what we don't know. And then we start having symptoms and we're like, what the heck? I don't understand why I'm having these problems and please help me fix them. Or they've gotten to the point where they're so disruptive that they feel like they've passed the point of no return. And I've said in previous episodes, and, you know, if you've been following me and Moon Essence for any length of time, I have been quoted even (laughs) as saying, I truly believe we could have an entire generation of bleeding bodies that don't know what period cramps are, that don't know the kind of pain and suffering that many of us have endured due to a collective lack of education. Now, when people attend public school, they talk about how not to get pregnant. Abstinence only, right? We live in an abstinence only education system. And the reality of that is that if you tell a teenager, don't do it, that's exactly what they're going to (laughs) do. Am I right? How many of you are nodding your head right now? So I really do believe that the stronger way to help our kids not have kids of their own before they're ready is to provide them with enough education around how their body works, that they not only can take care of their cycle health, which is a really big part of this, but they also know how to be in the driver's seat of their fertility should they choose to make decisions that maybe you as a parent aren't super excited about, right? 
it is normal to have a sex drive. We tend to shame female bodies for being sexual creatures. It is not a bad thing. It is actually a sign of health that there is interest. However, they don't need to act on it. There's that. But should they choose to act on it, because we are talking about teenagers here, and I know that this topic is going to make some of you go, oh, I don't want to think about my baby doing this, right? I get it. I totally get it. But wouldn't you rather equip them with the correct information than have them learn, and I use that with air quotes and (laughs) a little bit of sarcasm, how to take care of their bodies and their fertility through friends that don't really know more than they do, right? So if you have the ability to get ahead of this conversation. So let's say you are listening and you have a young person under the age of 12. This is the prime time, guys, <laughs> because they haven't started feeling weird in their body yet. They aren't uncomfortable with the fact that they kind of feel like they're along for the ride and their hormones are taking them on a roller coaster ride. And they are now doing this cycling thing, which makes them feel all kinds of things because society says that bleeding bodies are gross. And I mean, I've had adult women in my practice hide their period from their partner because their partner makes them feel so much shame for being a bleeding body. Our societal container has done a really good job at making us feel shame around being sexual beings and being bleeding bodies. And neither of those things are shameful nor wrong, even though they make us feel that way. I remember when I was a teenager, I used to feel really uncomfortable about people knowing that I was on my period and I would tuck a pad or a tampon up the sleeve of my sweater and I would run to the bathroom because I was afraid somebody was going to find out. Got a lot more complicated in the summertime when I didn't have a sleeve to tuck it into, (laughs) right? But I felt there was this unwritten understanding that there was something shameful about it. And it wasn't a narrative that I was, or a form of rhetoric that I was getting at home. Not at all. I was really blessed to have a mom that sat down with me with a book at nine years old. And to be quite frank, one of the few things I remember from that book was the fact that strawberries were really good to eat during your period. (laughs) And I really liked strawberries at the time, right? But if you start normalizing the conversation at that age then it doesn't seem so weird or uncomfortable or shame-filled or anything like that when your child starts to get older. I have tried to normalize conversations about bodies with my own kids since the beginning. It started with getting a child home on the bus asking about Mr. B because there was a boy on the bus that had an erection. And everybody was curious about how he had this magic thing happening in his pants. I want to say the child that brought that home was maybe seven at the time. So real, real young, seven, eight, I think. And everybody giggled and laughed about it. You could tell that like they felt a little weird, but they were curious, right? And I just matter of factly explained what was happening. Because I didn't want the boys in my house to feel like that was a shameful thing. And I didn't want the girls in my house to think that it was weird, right? So starting these conversations when they're young is really, really helpful. Because then by the time, and yes, it's uncomfortable for you. I totally get it. I totally get it. What parent wants to start thinking about their little baby that they have 
fostered into the world, right? Whether you birth them from your body or they come into your experience in another magical way through adoption, et cetera, you have had a vested interest in this child and so much love for this child since the beginning, right? So when you get to this topic, you want to protect them from all the things that might hurt them. You want to protect them from society, making them feel shame around their body. You want to protect them from becoming a teen parent because you know where you are in your life, how that will fundamentally change their future. You want to protect them, right? You don't want them to experience the period problems or period cramps that you experienced. You just want to protect them. That is a normal, healthy parental instinct. And yet all we can do is provide them with the best education possible and the most open ear that we possibly can so that when they have these questions, they feel comfortable enough to be able to come share them with you. So starting early is really important because it normalizes it using proper names of body parts. Even if you feel fluttery, weird, uncomfortable, amped up by a certain question, being able to take a breath and literally calm your body to be able to deliver the news, right? To be able to talk about whatever it is, like you were talking about picking up shoes off the floor or, you know, where you're going to go for dinner this weekend or whatever, right? Like you deliver that in a fairly here's the news kind of way, right? When we're talking about sexuality, sexual function, all of these kinds of things, shit gets weird, right? It gets weird for the kid because they feed off your energy, It's not different than when they were really little and you were stressed out about something and the baby cried harder. Like it's no different. They can feel that you feel uncomfortable. They can feel that they have treaded into a territory that maybe they shouldn't be going. And if they feel that energy from you, they're going to shut down. By the time they turn 13, 12, 13, I have found in my household, 13 seems to be the magic number of, nope, I'm really uncomfortable and I don't want to talk to you about my body now. None of the functions, nothing that looks weird to me. Nope, don't want to talk about it. If you can reach them earlier than that, then you know they have information on board. And you don't have to sit down with charts and easels and graphs and all of this kind of stuff, right? I found the easiest way to have these conversations is to integrate them into everyday types of conversations. For example, I had a child to get off the bus who noticed the magic of an erection. (laughs) And everybody in the back of the bus was calling it Mr. B and joking about it. So I had curious kids that got off of said bus because they heard everything that was going on in the back. This is before I started homeschooling. And they're like, mom, guess what we learned about today? (laughs) And I just had to take a breath because my kids were little. That was the last thing that I ever expected them to tell me about. I expected them to tell me about frogs and paintings and we did this in music class. Oh, no, no, this was totally not what I expected. And I remember I needed to take a big breath because it shocked me. It wasn't that it made me uncomfortable. I just really didn't expect to be tackling that topic so early on. And I took a deep breath and I was like, oh, I see. Well, this is what it is. And I used the proper names and I explained what happened. And I made it sound like this is something that happens every day. Not a big deal. And they all were like, oh, and they accepted that information. And it was no longer a tee hee hee joke. And they went about their merry way and they forgot all about it. I've talked to them about said conversation later on. They do remember the conversation, but they don't feel like it was a big deal. And I have like 16, 14, and almost 13 in my house now, right? So 
the fact that they remember it and they remember the information, but they remember not feeling weird about it because mom didn't make it weird. So birds and bees talks don't have to be awkward. And I do get asked by a lot of my clients, like, how the hell do I have this conversation with my child? Or I have a teen. They don't want to talk to me about it. Can I bring them in to talk to you about it? Sure. It, sometimes it's just different coming from somebody that's not your mom. There is a course called Body Basics that I have designed with this in mind. It is not sexually focused because that's the biggest thing. In our Western culture, your traditional sex ed program, and again, not everyone is like this. This is an average, right? There's always outliers to every average. But in general, because I do work with people internationally in my practice, nationally and internationally, and they aren't taught any of this stuff. Once in a while, I will get somebody who had a parent that really taught them about their cycle, about tracking it, about what to look for, about how to tell if something didn't seem right, you know, what different forms of contraception were, like all that kind of stuff. But that is rare. Hats off to the moms that have done that with their kids because it's not easy. You don't want to think about your kid being old enough to be tangling with some of these adult themes and topics, right? You want to protect your kid. But the reality is, is not sharing this information with them is far more detrimental because then they don't know how to protect themselves against STDs. They don't know how to take care of their bleeding body. So every time their cycle comes, it starts becoming more and more symptomatic. I have worked with more 14 and 15 year old girls who have been cycling for two or three years at that point. Their cycles are irregular. They're in massive amounts of pain. And their parents are threatening to put them on birth control because that is the only thing their doctor really offers. And let's talk about how detrimental that can be. Birth control turns off the hormones that are trying to practice to bring a healthy cycle to fruition. When young people start cycling, it can take up to five years to establish a normal healthy cycle without intervention, right? Like not working with somebody like me that's supporting that healthy expression. That's a long time. And because that can become a very symptomatic time in the lives of many teenagers for a lot of reasons, this is where many of them, myself included, get put on birth control. That has life-altering consequences. That's the whole reason I'm doing this episode. Because I, like I said at the beginning, I truly believe that you can have an entire generation of girls that have no idea what period problems are. But it really does boil down to education. What do they know about their body? I'm going to pause this incredible episode to share an opportunity for you to join me as a reproductive rebel. As you know, I'm a holistic women's health practitioner who practices with a focus in East Asian medicine. I truly am one of a kind in the way that I practice, and that is a part of what makes me a rebel. I am here to disrupt a healthcare model for women and provide natural and effective solutions for all phases in a woman's life. Do you feel called to make a difference in women's health? Whether you are already a practitioner working in this space, wishing to add to your toolkit, or you are just a passionate rebel with a calling to make a difference for others as I was at the start of my career in this field, the Holistic Women's Health Practitioner Program is open for enrollment. I am looking for passionate, committed, and heart-centered people who desire to make a difference in the women's health space and desire to make it a place where women feel seen and heard. 
where their needs and concerns aren't gaslit, but really taken seriously and met with compassion and education to help them reach their goals. Does this sound like you? If so, please check out the program link in the show notes and schedule a one-on-one talk with me or join a free information session. Or if you know that without a doubt, this is where you want to go, enroll and get started today. Together, we will make a difference for the future of women's health care. I can't wait for you to join me. And now back to the show. School does a great job with abstinence only. Here's all of the creepy crawly things that you can get. The only true way to make sure you don't get pregnant is abstinence. If you do engage, here are your birth control options. But they don't say anything about caring for the cycle. Yeah, they might do an anatomy unit and teach about ovaries and fallopian tubes and the uterus and the penis and the testes and the vas deferens. Like, sure, they might give you body part names and you have to identify them on a diagram, right? I remember doing that. But that actually doesn't give the bleeding body a guidebook as to how to care for their body. It doesn't talk about the fact that there are going to be parts of the month that you feel more tired. There are going to be parts of the month that if you are competing in a sport, you're going to be an unstoppable force of nature. You're going to have parts of the month where you need to rest more. And maybe you don't go out with your friends every freaking night. I'm living that right now. So how to care for your body is so incredibly important. And that's what my Body Basics course is all about, is the stuff we're not getting in school. A lot of adults take this class and go, oh my gosh, where has this information been all my life? Just not taught in public school. That's where it's been. And this is why this is such an important topic for me. And it's funny, some of the topics that come up in this show, I'll have like a string of clients that'll come into the office and they'll all have the same challenge. And I'm like, oh, clearly I need to talk to the world about this. So this is one of those topics. I don't know if it's because this is being recorded right around the time of graduation and there's a lot of like fear around the freedom of summer because they're no longer in the structure of school. I'm not sure, but it's coming up a lot lately. So I'm feeling very called to talk about this right now because when we understand that there are phases in the cycle, what those phases are doing, the fact that you can eat a certain way to support those phases, there is certain care... (laughs) We're going to call it care and use or handling rules (laughs) for different phases because your body needs different things at different times. It's going to help the hormones come online and start to communicate in a healthy way faster if the body has the right tools to do that with. So body basics takes you through, well, what is my body doing? And how do I care for myself? What can I expect? And it's done all from the cycle-focused perspective. Because really and truly, if our young people with bleeding bodies understand that they can only get pregnant seven days out of the month and know how to protect themselves during that time frame and have a predictable enough cycle that they can make those plans, then they are in the driver's seat of making sure they don't get pregnant. How many times have we heard about teenagers that go, oh, I had no idea? Or couples that have come into my office that have been trying to get pregnant for years operating on this understanding that they had from when they were a teenager because their friends told them about this stuff that like I had one couple, the woman came in and she goes, yeah, we've been trying for three years. We're devastated, so frustrated. We haven't gotten one positive pregnancy test. I don't understand why. And 
I started asking her about when they were trying. They only tried in the five days before her bleed because that's when her friend in high school told her that's when she was the most fertile. And her partner didn't know to challenge that either. I saw a great reel. Maybe I should walk around where I am and do something similar. But I saw a reel where this girl was walking around with a microphone and she was walking up to men on the street. And she was asking them, like, how many days out of the month is a woman fertile? And they had no idea. How many days out of the month does a woman bleed? How many tampons should be using in the course of a day? I don't agree with the tampon part, but bear with me, right? And nobody could answer those questions. So this information is critically important for both the partner that bleeds as well as the partner that doesn't. I have made damn sure my son understands how cycles work because if he's dating a girl who is not on birth control, he is as responsible as she is for whether they engage at a time where there's risk. Because then he's making an active choice that should a pregnancy result, I'm ready to become a dad. And my 16-year-old always scowls at me when I say stuff like that, but it's true. And I think as much as he rolls his eyes at me, it really does sink in and it does hit home that she is not the only one responsible for understanding her body. He has a role in that too. And if he understands, then he can help be proactive. Honestly, in the relationship he's in now, he knows more about how her body works than she does. And I'm really proud of that. I mean, I feel sad that she doesn't, and that's not my place to pry, but I find it very comforting to know that my son has enough information that he knows how to be a compassionate partner. He knows how to ask the right questions about where she is in her cycle. So regardless of whether he ends up with somebody who's on birth control or not, he knows that he needs to bring protection. He needs to come protected. He needs to have that conversation. And again, you get lots of eye rolling and, oh, mom, stop. Like that kind of stuff will happen when you're talking to your teenager. But it is getting in there. It is. I think the most important thing that we can do to try to help, because like, yes, it is great to be able to start these conversations before you get to this point. But let's say you're sitting there with a 14-year-old and you're like, oh my God, this kid just is totally shutting me out and doesn't want to talk to me about this stuff. What do I do now? The best thing that you can do is to go into it as calm as you possibly can, with as open a mind as you possibly can. And I understand how hard that is. Trust me. I've had some conversations with my teens that have made me feel really weird inside. <laughs> and I do this for a living, right? Because you don't want to think about your baby being old enough for that kind of thing, right? But I would rather they have correct information from the beginning so that they can prevent pregnancy, they can take care of their cycle. Their cycle can actually regulate in a healthy and normal way that isn't going to affect their moods, their endocrine system, like fill in the blank. Like we're starting to see studies come out that people of my age group, and I'm in my 40s now, still a hard number to get out of my mouth, but it's true, that those of us who were pushed straight into the birth control track because of period problems at the very beginning of our cycling lives, are now starting to see big problems with osteopenia and osteoporosis. The choices that are made when they are a teen to regulate their cycle and prevent pregnancy will have lifelong effects for them. I'm not saying this to shame anyone. I'm saying this because knowledge is power. If you know that, 
then you're able to help seek out alternative solutions for helping your child have a stress-free, symptom-free period. You're able to get resources that maybe it's easier to sit them down in front of something like Body Basics to learn instead of talking to them face-to-face. Maybe you sit down and follow up with them afterwards and go, what did you learn? Maybe you sit with them and you go, holy shit, I didn't know that. And then your teen will go, oh, oh, okay, right? Because I look back at my life, and I am saying this both from personal experience as well as professional experience. I've had many, many women over the years also echo the same sentiment. Because birth control makes your partner smell like brother and not other, it changes who you are attracted to. If you want more information about that, there's a great documentary called The Business of Birth Control. I'd highly recommend it. It will totally change your perspective on using contraception and how you use contraception. There are hormone-free options, and no, I'm not talking about the copper IUD that can give you BV, et cetera. I'm talking about a Kaya diaphragm. I'm talking about a condom, right? But those are only so effective. When you know how your cycle works, you know, fertility awareness has been demonstrated to be 99.4% effective when used properly. That's more effective than any form of contraception out there on the market. Obviously, if there is P and V action, there is the possibility for a pregnancy, but that's really good odds. Much, much higher than 83 to 85% with any other contraception method. So wouldn't you want your kid to have the most information possible so that not only they feel better and they have fewer symptoms, but then they have the knowledge to actually make wiser choices instead of playing roulette and ending up with something that may forever change their life, whether it's a permanent STD or a pregnancy, right? And in today's world, Pregnancy is hard because there are fewer and fewer options available in terms to make choices that feel aligned because our body sovereignty is really being challenged and called into question. Our body autonomy, our ability to choose, depending on where you are, you might not have a choice at all. So with all of this in mind, it makes teaching our kids from a young age more important than ever how their cycle works. Because if you have a healthy cycle, then you know where your fertile window is. You can predict it. You can find it. You know what you're looking for. And that, honestly, is the most effective form of birth control. And it's a win-win. You're getting rid of period problems. You're regulating your hormones. You're making sure your bones stay strong until you're later on in your life or through later on in your life. And you know how to make appropriate choices around your fertility and how you use it or don't. So this conversation can be one of the hardest for many parents. It is. It's tough. But the more you can be calm and seem open and receptive, and even if they're asking you questions that make you want to crawl out of your skin, hold a crystal in your hand, take some cleansing breaths and still your body. Because remember, your reaction to their question is coming from your story your history, the messages you were given as a young person, the shame you felt around your body, the guilt you felt around being a bleeding body. Those are all your stories and they're not yours to project onto your kid. And some days it's hard. It really is hard. But the more open and physically soft 
you can be when you have this conversation with your child and when you have continued conversations with your child. They might catch you off guard, but if you are able to still yourself and take a couple of breaths and be like, okay, you want to have a conversation about this? Maybe you need to pour both of you a glass of water and that's the moment that you take to calm your body so that you can be receptive and open. That is going to change the entire narrative around how that young person feels about their body for the rest of their life. This isn't just an awkward topic right now. This isn't just an awkward sex conversation. This literally shapes and is one of the things that feeds how they feel about themselves, their intrinsic value, their self-esteem, their body image for the rest of their life. Think back to some of the things that made you feel shame. They were messages from outside of you, right? Yes, it's normal to feel uncomfortable when you're going through some of these developmental stages because your body is doing all kinds of things. Your hormones are taking you on a ride that doesn't feel really comfortable. Sure, there are parts that come from within you that aren't really enjoyable because that's part of puberty. But a lot of how we shape our body image and how we feel comes from the messages we receive from other people the validation we receive from other people, what we're told by other people. You are a critical piece in that puzzle. And I know you can do it. And I totally believe in you. So the earlier you can talk to your kids about it and start to normalize the conversation, the better. But if you are one of those people that you are now facing these conversations and you have somebody who's over the age of 13, the more you can seem open and willing and accepting of who they are and calm whatever the story is in your head, it will help your communication with them and it will help them forever shape how they feel about themselves. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at moonessence.life. And if you're interested, the information about Body Basics will be in the show notes. I highly recommend both adults and teens alike take a look at that video. It gives you a lot of the pieces and parts about how your body works that we just simply weren't taught in school. And it's short, I promise, short, sweet, and to the point. But it gives you some great tips and tricks for things that you can start that day to be able to help reduce period symptoms. And as always, I'm totally here for you for any questions you may have. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Reproductive Rebel. Reproductive Rebel is recorded by certified peristeam hydrotherapist and acutonics practitioner, herbalist, and Chinese nutritional therapist, Adrian Irizari of Moon Essence LLC. If you are interested in setting up an appointment for one-on-one -on -one support, ordering from our store, or checking out our course offerings, visit our website at moonessence.life. Be sure to subscribe to our newsletter and get insider information on upcoming events and offerings. Join the conversation. Like and follow us at Moon Essence Me on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn. Your voices make this program possible. Thank you all for your continued support.